this year has been an incredible year for us as a family for two major reasons. One, we are celebrating a milestone in our relationship because Kath and I have been together this year for 40 years. 40 years. This is kind of cool. It was on March the 17th, 1984, at 10.25 at the local roller skating rink that I just grabbed her hands, skated backwards, looked in her eyes as Bonnie Tyler's Total Eclipse of the Heart was playing. <laughs> you might say, why was I skating backwards? Because I can. <laughs> and I asked her to be my girlfriend. I simply said, will you go out with me? She said yes. And we've been together ever since, which is just awesome. So we've been, we've been celebrating a sabbatical. We've been on holidays for the last six months, traveling the world like love-struck teenagers, just enjoying life together, which has just been amazing. And the other thing we've been celebrating is the fact that we, along with the Clarks, are celebrating the birth of our church that we planted 30 years ago amazing. this year, which is just amazing. So... which was really, really cool. And uh, we had a big celebration at the 30th and had some friends over for dinner, which was amazing. And, and you know in that moment where your friends give speeches and it's just beautiful and it's amazing, it's a little bit embarrassing. You're saying, oh, please stop. But you're like, go, keep going, keep going. <laughs> and we had that moment. But then there was this one friend of ours that said something that just caught my attention and grabbed me in the moment because what he said was profound and while I appreciated it, it made me ponder and think. And he just, he said, I want to say thank you for being yourself. Thank you for being your authentic self. And that moment just grabbed me because I started to think about what that has taken for me to be my authentic self. And I love the church. That's why I started with I love the church. But the church at times is one of the hardest places to be your authentic self. I love the church with all of my heart. But for me to remain my authentic self, for us to remain our authentic selves, has been a fight. It's been a battle. Particularly when you have a personality like me and a surname like Rainbow. <laughs> I have felt at times there are people who feel called by God as their mission to take the colour out of my last name. And I've been told many times that I'm a show-off. Can you believe that? Me, a show-off. There's a show-off. At least I'm not wearing a tank top. <laughs> Seriously. Someone get the man a shirt. You're just making me look bad. Jesus said that he came to set us free. And I don't know about you, but I am glad that Jesus came to set me and each and every one of us in this room free. Who is glad that Jesus has set you free? Is there anyone who is glad that Jesus has set you free? Do you remember that day? Do you remember that day when you gave your life to Jesus? Some of you raised your hand. Some of you ran down the front. Some of you wept. Some of you laughed. Some of you jumped. Some of you danced. It was just an amazing, amazing experience. That moment of salvation. That moment where you sensed freedom in Christ for the very first time. Being set free is an amazing experience. And it's a one-off experience that we all get to experience when we first give our life to Jesus. But what I've found ever since that moment is staying free yeah. is a whole lot harder. Yes. It's a whole lot harder. Yeah. And so tonight, if you're taking notes and you like titles, like I like making up titles, I've simply entitled this Freedom Fighters. Can you say Freedom Fighters? Yes. 
When pastors get you to repeat stuff, it's for two reasons. One is so that you memorize it. The other is so that they can take a drink. So one more time, say freedom fighters. Freedom fighters. <laughs> 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 ah, excuse me. Freedom fighters. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Because staying free yeah. is not as easy yeah. as being set free. Being set free is a work of the cross. Staying free is a battle. It's a fight. And I would encourage every one of you in this room tonight, I trust that you leave this place with courage, with a glint in your eye, with a smile on your face, with a spring in your step, that you could leave this place free, freer than you came today. Amen. And while I said I love the church, I really do, but... The church is one of the hardest places to stay free. Why? Because of the expectation. We have expectations. We just do. And there's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes those expectations create pressure. And sometimes that pressure creates bondage. And let's be honest, most of us don't set out to do that. It's just the result of us wanting the best for people. It's like... Mums who look at little Johnny who's got a t-shirt on and it's freezing cold outside and and he's fine, but mum's cold and so she wants to put a jumper on little Johnny. Johnny's like, I don't need the jumper. Every mum kind of knows what I'm talking about and that's a well-intentioned thought. There's nothing wrong with that except little Johnny doesn't need your jumper. And a lot of that stuff takes place in this beautiful place called the church. And the last thing I want to do is bash the church. But I am here with a love in my heart for the church. And hopefully what I share today will help us. And so this morning, let's just, uh, this evening, let's just simply pray and then we'll move on. Father, we just thank you for your goodness, your faithfulness. We thank you for all the incredible stories we've already heard tonight. And I just ask and pray that you take my words. And you'd use them, Lord, to bring freedom, life, and joy into this place today. And we ask all of that in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. If we don't continue to stay free and live free, we can find ourselves being more bound than when we were saved. And that's what we want to try and avoid today. And this often produces two outcomes, that we either lose our freedom and we become robots doing things out of obligation based on the law. We have to go to church. Got to go to church. Some of you might be here tonight because I've got to go. I can't miss it. And while that's a, that's a good thing to be in church, it can become a bondage just because we feel we have to be there. And so we create robots and that was never the intention. And something, I'm not going to do that. And so we, we don't do that and we go to the other extreme and we just become rebels and we just do our own thing and we think I'm not going to be told what to do I'm just going to do my own thing and so we become either robots or rebels and you know what I've learned the enemy doesn't really care which one it is for us as long as it's either one of those he doesn't care whether we're rebellious or we're robotic in our relationship Jesus however he wants, to use, he wants to use our freedom for another way. See, the answer to abuse is not no use, but it's correct use. And we're really good. If something's not working, we just chuck that out and we just try the next thing. But what we learn from the life of Jesus is that he was completely free and yet under full authority. How can you be completely free And yet, under authority. Has anyone ever thought that? You see, Jesus is completely his authentic self. No one was going to put anything on Jesus, and they tried. And yet, he was under full authority. In actual fact, his authority was a real talking point amongst the people. In Luke chapter 4, verse 32, it says, They were amazed at his teaching. Why? Because it wasn't like the other teachers, his teaching had authority. Question, where did this authority come from? 
through being under authority. So Jesus wasn't a rebel. He was a man under authority. He wasn't rebellious. He wasn't doing his own thing. He was completely under the submission of a higher authority. Jesus said on one occasion, I only do what I see my father doing. He knew what it was to honor his parents. Even when he was on the cross with all the stuff that he was going through, physically, emotionally, spiritually, he looks down and sees his mum weeping. And in a weakened state, he, he looks to one of the disciples, John, and says, can you take care of mum? Talk about honour. He honoured the law in its entirety. Jesus was not a rebel. His actions were not robotic. They were not rebellious. But they were birthed out of a relationship with his father. See, law produces robots. And license produces rebels. But love produces relationship. And relationship is the goal. I showed you a photo of our family just a minute ago. But when Mitch got married to Caitlin in New Zealand last year, I was asked to do a speech, which isn't normal because it's normally the father of the bride, but Mitch said, Dad, I'd love you to do a speech as well. So I said, not a problem. And I'll never forget what I said, and I'll never forget the looks on people's faces as I said, Caitlin, I would love to welcome you into the family. And everyone's ready, poised, ready to clap. You know. And I said, but I can't. <laughs> and it went as quiet as it is right now. <laughs> and then I explained why I couldn't welcome her into our family, I said, because she's not joining our family. Mitch and Caitlin are starting their own family. And one of the things I know that breaks down new families is overbearing extended families. That put on expectation after all we've done for you. Do you know the pain you put your mother through at the birthing process? <laughs> We don't mean to do that, but we just love them so much. We just don't want to let go. And I just wanted from the very outset to say, Mitch, Caitlin, we love you. And we love you so much that we are willing to let you go. Because I don't want you coming around our home because you have to. I don't want you coming to dinner because you have to. But do I want them to come around? Oh, you better believe I do. Do you think for one moment I don't want to see them again? Oh my gosh, I would see them every day if I could. You know the amazing thing? Although Mitch lives in another country, we're forever on the phone. We're forever talking, communicating. This morning I received five brand new photos of our granddaughter. And no one made them do that. And do you know what that does for a glamorous granddad? <laughs> And a glamour, it just makes our day because we never made them. It wasn't a robotic response. It was a response that was produced out of love and relationship. And they want to share the joy. They want to share the love. They want to share. But we took a risk because we said, hey, you're your own team. And they are. They are. And the last thing I want to do is start controlling them, manipulating them, because the information I have, maturity I have, years of experience, and rob them of what God is wanting to do in their team. Yeah. Mitch is the captain of his team. Nathaniel is the captain of our daughter's team, Jordan. And we give them the room and the space. And it's so wonderful when they phone us. It's wonderful when Jordan said, hey, can we come around your house for dinner? <laughs> I said, well, we can go around yours. No, let's go to your house. <laughs> it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. See, God wants us to be free and with the help of the Holy Spirit to stay free. 
As I've already mentioned before, freedom can be found in a moment, but staying free is a process. And I do not believe we can do this in our own strength. I am speaking out of my struggle. I'm speaking tonight out of my battles and and, 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 and contemplating, am I being big-headed? Am I this? Are they right? Should I not be this? Should I, should I be less of that? Should I be more of that? Yeah. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Mm. And I've had to wrestle that. And, and tonight, I hope, through my experience, we can all help each other yeah. stay free. Everyone say, stay free. stay free. In John chapter 16, verse 12, it says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. These are the words of Jesus But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he'll guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will only speak what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what is known to you and make it known to you. All that belongs to my father, sorry, all that belongs to the father is mine. And that is why I said the spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. I love this thought that the Holy Spirit will lead us into truth. If you're anything like me, you would pray, I just want to know, give it to me all now. I I, I can handle it. (laughs) We can't handle it. And so Jesus has given us a precious gift of the Holy Spirit to lead us into truth, one step at a time. And he does that because we're all at different stages and phases of life. And so he speaks to me about what I need to do or not do, keep doing or stop doing because of where I'm at. And at the same time, he's speaking to you about what you need to do or not do or keep doing or stop doing based upon where you are at. I told a story this morning about my reluctance to go into ministry. And what I'm about to quickly tell you is pretty embarrassing on my part. It's so superficial. Because my pastor was asking me one day about ministry and what I thought. I was a teenager. And I was loving life at the time. And I did not want to go into ministry. And I was very dismissive. I just said, no thank you. I went to bed that night and I just felt incredibly convicted that I was incredibly rude to my pastor and incredibly dismissive to what God may have for me in the future. And then I had this kind of discussion in my bed with God. You know those discussions you have? I've never heard the audible voice of God, but I know the voice of God. And I felt God say to me, what's your problem? (laughs) The kind of thing that God said to Adam, like, Adam, where you at? And I felt God say to me, Tony, what's, what's your problem? And I had to think about that for a minute, because I didn't really know my problem. But as I thought about it, I thought, well, I do have a problem. Because as a teenager, I loved God. I loved our pastor, and I loved the local church I belonged to. But I didn't want to be a pastor. Because all the pastors back then, and and please, no disrespect if you fit into either one of these categories. But it was a big deal to me as a teenager. My impression of all ministers is they were overweight and they didn't have much hair. <laughs> so bad, so bad. And I, I found myself saying that out loud, oh, so sound, sound so bad. And the way God responded to me was just one of those beautiful moments because he met me where I was at, in my superficial, selfish, pathetic so bad, it, state. And I felt him say this. He said, hey, Tony, if you look after your body, I'll look after your hair. (laughs) The thing I didn't do with that is make that a law. The thing I didn't do with that is put that on everyone else. So if you're sitting there, I should have prayed that prayer. No, you shouldn't. That was just me and where I was at at that time. God meets us where we're at. And I'd never make that a theology. Herein lies a problem. People don't tend to see things as they are. They see things as they are. 
you get that? They don't see things as they are. They see things as they are. And as a result, we tend to judge accordingly. And Jesus said in John chapter 24, verse 7, stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. So Jesus didn't say don't judge. He said judge correctly. We tend to judge superficially. There are some things that are definitely right and wrong. You know, I'm not gonna, you're not going to hear me say, murder's okay, you can murder someone. So if you were thinking, hey, I wonder if he's going to say that's okay. No. But they're the obvious ones, and they don't tend to bring too much bondage. They're pretty obvious, those ones. But it's the things that we perceive are right and wrong that tend to bring the problems and the bondage. Because we feel very strong that I don't think that's right. So... A couple of years ago, I decided to grow my hair long, and it got really long. And I also, at the same time, decided I'm going to ride a motorbike. And I looked something like this. And in that time, do you know how many people said to me, he's having a midlife crisis? Yeah, yeah. And do you know what I did? I stopped and asked myself this question. Am I having a midlife crisis? (laughs) Or is it something else? Am I having a midlife crisis? Or am I coming into a new season in my life of freedom? Two of our kids don't even live at home anymore. Do you know how much more money we have now? Financial freedom, baby. (laughs) Is it a midlife crisis or is it a season of more freedom financially? Without those kids around, guess what? I've got more time. I've got more freedom in time now. And so I chose to use the little bit of extra freedom I had financially and time just to do something I always wanted to do but I just put on hold till the right time. And I'm so glad I was able to have that interaction with Holy Spirit to help me decipher whether it is a midlife crisis because if it is, I need to know that. (laughs) The last thing you want to do when you're having a midlife crisis is say, no, this is just new financial freedom. You don't want that. And I'm so grateful for the Holy Spirit who's able to speak into those situations. And so as a result of knowing the truth, because the Bible says it's the truth that sets you free, not a truth. Everyone will throw a truth at you. Ah, your hair is getting longer. That was true. That was a truth. But it doesn't mean now, because of that, I am having a midlife crisis. And so because I got my answer that I needed, it set me free. And when people say you're having a midlife crisis, I just join in and said, that's so funny, it's true, isn't it? But one thing I didn't do is just stop growing my hair. One thing I didn't do is sell my motorbike because that would be to put me back into bondage. See how it creeps in? I think when it comes to how we decipher whether someone is right or wrong is often measured by the wrong metric. And so I want to look at four things that have helped me when it comes to making decisions to stay free. I don't have long, so I'm going to quickly rush through them very quickly. A better question to ask than is it right or wrong is this. Number one, is it righteous or unrighteous? See, when it comes to money, for example, question, is it right or wrong to have a lot of money? Is is that a sign of uh, blessing? For some it might be, for some it might not be. But at the end of the day, money's neutral. It's what we do with it. 
And often what we do with what we have is more important to God than what we actually have. Because we can have money and be righteous with money, and we can have money and be unrighteous with money. You can be poor and be righteous, and you can be poor and be unrighteous. And so one thing I've found that's helped keep me free is asking a question like, is this righteous or unrighteous? We decided a number of years ago as a church to do a men's event called The Bloke. And we want to do something different because I felt like most men's ministry around the world was just women's ministry in disguise. That's what I just... <laughs> and we were just copying the women and what they did. So, so they worship, we worship. And men, I don't want to do that. I, I don't want to sing next to another guy. You know. And so I thought, well, what could we do? We could meet men halfway. And we came up with this idea to do an event called The Bloke around three things that men like. Burgers, beer, and boxing. Do you know the flack we cop for that? We got so many emails when we put the advertising out there. I got one email saying, Ichabod, they called us Ichabod. That's all they put on it. I was like, Ichabod, the Lord has departed. I'm like, wow. Now, here's the question. Could beer, burger, and boxing be unrighteous? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely it could. But could it be used as an event? that brings the glory of God. Well, I'm here to tell you, yes, it can, because that's exactly what we saw. We had these incredible events. We saw boxing, we saw cars, we saw all kinds of things, and I I had the incredible privilege to stand in the boxing ring and just share the gospel. And I tried to do it in a way that was relevant to the men that were there. My first time I ever did it, I preached on three things that beer has taught me about life. (laughs) And all of you right now want to know those three points. (laughs) So don't judge me. <laughs> but my last point was this, that beer doesn't just happen. You can't put anything you do into a glass and call it beer. No, it takes someone who knows what they're doing to put that together. And I said, if that's true for beer, how much more for a person? Yeah. And then I said, now in the red corner we have... No, this. <laughs> Is it righteous or is it unrighteous? Secondly, is it healthy or is it unhealthy? Do you know the debate about big church, small church? As if big church is better or big church is worse, small church is better, small church is better. It's irrelevant. The question is, is it healthy? You can have a large healthy church and you can have a large unhealthy church. Do not kid yourself that every small church is healthy. There are some very, very unhealthy small churches with very mean people in it. I've, I've been to some. I mean, I love people, but some people. <laughs> is it healthy or is it unhealthy? Do you know every one of us has a personality and a gift from God? And with that gift, you can use it to bring glory to God when you're healthy. Do you know I'm an incredibly deep thinker? And in a healthy space, that makes me an incredible problem solver. It makes me incredibly creative. I come up with this whole idea about the bloke and the beer, the burger. It's amazing. That, that, that's me healthy. But me unhealthy, and it happens way too often for my liking, that thinking becomes overthinking, becomes worry, that leads to anxiety, start fretting. Me, worried. Can you imagine that? I can worry with the best of you when I'm unhealthy. And so when I'm worrying, I use that as a warning now. I say, oh, if I'm so worried, that's telling me something. I'm using my God gift to think in an unhealthy way. Thirdly, is it wise or is it unwise? If you haven't touched, is it right or wrong? Let's stay away from that. You shouldn't do that. Why? Who said? You did. I knew when I was growing my hair, there was a lot of people with hair, people that were losing hair that were saying, you shouldn't be growing your hair. I said, at least I can. (laughs) 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 One guy did say that to me. He said, no, he came at me. He said, why are you growing your hair? I said, because I can. (laughs) They they walked off. (laughs) Anyway, it doesn't matter. Okay. Is it wise or is it unwise? 
Do you know, I'll never forget this moment where I went to Queensland to be with my family who just immigrated from the UK and went up there, had a great time, and I had a beer and went out with my cousins. It was amazing. Invited them to come down. Six months later, they came down. And I invited him to the youth group that I was part of. And he starts telling this story. Oh, mate, you should see Tony when he came up. It was an amazing night. He was so drunk. <laughs> and I've got all these youth pastors looking at me. And my... <laughs> was I drunk? You want to know, don't you? No, I wasn't. But I did have a drink. And I just learned something for me that I didn't put on anyone else. I made a decision that day that I'm not going to let alcohol get the credit for all of this. <laughs> I honestly, I don't need alcohol to be the life of the party. I just don't. I never have. And I certainly don't want getting, uh, alcohol getting the credit for this. And so I just chose not to drink till the age of about 40. And now I'm making up for it. I know. <laughs> I just didn't think it was right for me, but I never said, you're not allowed. Because that was a word for me. I want to live in freedom. And by not drinking, that kept me in freedom. But I didn't want to put anyone in bondage because of the newfound freedom I'd experienced. And the last one, if the band can come up, that'd be great. Is number four is, are you becoming better or bitter? In other words, how's your belief system working out for you? Is it leading to freedom or bondage? Paul writes to the Galatians, he says this. This was his measure. Where's your joy gone? He didn't talk about the end times when Jesus came. He didn't say that. He said, dude, where's your joy And if you find yourself getting less joyful, they say that children laugh a lot more than adults. You know why? Because we get bitter, not better. In 2016, I think I've shared this story before, but we had an incredibly strange, weird year. We affectionately call it something else, which I will not repeat in this room, but 2016 took on another name for us because of all the things that happened. In January, our youth pastor died, got struck by lightning. In March, my wife had a cancer scare. In April, Mitchie broke his arm. In May, I had a blood infection which almost killed me. I survived that, praise God. But the blood (laughs) infection did damage one of my heart valves, so I had to have heart surgery. And this went on and on and on right through the end of the year. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't get many answers for that year. To this moment in time, I still don't have any answers for you. Why did that happen? I don't know. But I'll never forget what happened on the 31st of December 2016 because I was walking my normal walk, praying to God, and I just was overwhelmed with gratitude for the incredible year that I just had because I chose to reframe it with a better narrative than what a horrible year. I didn't get any answers and I still don't have answers, but you know what I did get because I got something and I got something really precious. I got God. And I got him at a whole nother level. I got him at a level of intimacy and depth I'd never experienced before. And with tears in my eyes, as I'm walking the public streets of our neighbourhood, I mean, I was loud crying. I said to Rory, I don't cry much. I think every story I've told, I cry. Obviously cry more than I actually give myself credit for, but I'm crying. I said, God, never let me forget this day. I want to mark this day, the 31st of December, 2016. May I never forget what an incredible year 2016 was. Why? Because I got God at a whole nother level. And I don't know what it is you're going through, but I know you're going through something. And if you're not going through something right now, you went through something recently. And if you haven't gone through something recently and you're not going through something now, guess what? You will in the future. Pain's just around the corner. (laughs) 
I went to many conferences in Australia where the keynote preacher would always say this, the best is yet to come. And I believe that and I say it all the time. But equally as true is this, the worst is yet to come. <laughs> best, worst, tears, wheat, they go together. Sheep, goats, good, bad, light, dark. You can't have Christianity with just light, rainbows and butterflies. I am a rainbow, but I don't always have rainbows and butterflies. <laughs> but we can always have God. Every moment of every day. Will you stand to your feet right now? Every day, we can have Him. Every day, we can just be in His presence. This is what I know. Every one of us will either get better or bitter. And not only is that a choice to become better, it's also a fight to become better. Better is found at the top of the mountain. Bitter is found in the valley. Better is a climb. Bitterness is a fall. And with the help of the Holy Spirit in this place tonight, I believe that God wants to put strength and courage into each and every one of us that we would commit to the climb of getting better and not bitter. That we might make a commitment here in this place with the help of the Holy Spirit to change our narrative from a negative one to a positive one that we would see His goodness and His grace, that we would be a people that hold on to the good. It's one of my favourite passages of Scripture because it's easy to remember and it's so powerful. Hold on to the good. Whatever church you're from tonight, hold on to the good. The Bible doesn't say hold on to the bad. We don't have to be reminded to do that. That just happens naturally. But to hold on to the good, to hold on to the great, is amazing. Please raise our hands to heaven. Father, we just thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your greatness. And we declare, we surrender afresh. We re surrender our lives. We recommit our lives to you afresh tonight. We, want, we don't want bitterness to get the better of us. We want your goodness to be our narrative. We want your grace to be our narrative. We want your joy to be our narrative. We want your hope to be our narrative. We want you, King Jesus, to be our narrative. So Holy Spirit, won't you come? Won't you saturate this place right here, right now, as we worship you and honour you and sing songs of praise and worship and adoration to your goodness today. And everyone says, Amen. Amen. Amen.